Hi guys, today's study tip. Try using the textbook's website. It's free for quizzes and animations. So they'll generate practice quizzes. This can really help you. Um, and the animations I've been telling you all semester. Watch them, watch them. Okay, don't forget, re look at the quizzes online from me on Canvas also, because you know those appear on your test. And then practice end of chapter questions as well. So you have lots of resources to help you get an A on your final. Okay. So urinary system part two. Recall you have a high concentration of sodium in the filtrate. So you're in the lumen of the kidney tubule, right? And you're going to have a passive diffusion of sodium into the cytoplasm and then you're going to need ATP to actively pump with your sodium potassium pump through into the capillary okay now this is where it starts to get a little heavy with the terminology so please watch out this first step going from the lumen into the um, proximal tubule cell is a co-transporter. So as the sodium naturally flows in, glucose will pair up and it will be co-transported into the cytoplasm. We call this secondary active transport and that's because the very next step requires ATP for the sodium to be pumped out. Also, Remember that this is a, a sodium potassium pump. So as sodium's going uh, into the blood, potassium's being taken out and that potassium's going to become part of your filtrate. Okay, so glucose is co-transported with sodium and it's called secondary active transport right here. Then you have a glucose transporter here that will just allow uh, diffusion it's facilitated because it is a protein channel right it's a glucose transporter uh, but it's diffusion just goes into the blood okay so next slide reabsorption of glucose so glucose is co-transported into the tubule out of the filtrate into the tubule cell with sodium you don't use ATP for that step, um, but it's called secondary active transport because the very next step does use ATP for the sodium. Okay, we have a lot of um, glucose transporters and they're very fast. So under normal conditions, a healthy individual will be able to reabsorb all of their glucose because your glucose transporters have a maximum of 375 milligrams glucose per minute. So again, um, a healthy, normal individual will never, their blood glucose levels would never be so high that they would exceed the ability to reabsorb, okay? So if anyone does go above that max, then glucose is exceeded, excreted in the urine and that's an indication of something's wrong, usually diabetes. Okay. Reabsorption continued. Potassium would have to be actively reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule if we needed it. Uh, chloride, chloride's easy. It always follows the sodium and it doesn't require energy. It's passive. Okay. So I know we actively pump sodium with the sodium potassium pump um, but chloride will just follow. Okay, urea. Urea is passively reabsorbed. Recall urea is a byproduct from amino acid catabolism. Now, you already know water is constantly leaving, right? We're reabsorbing water through most of the entire um, nephron except for the ascending, right? So everywhere except for the ascending loop of Henle, we are absorbing water. That is making 
the filtrate concentration of urea higher, right? If you remove water, whatever's left is now more concentrated. And so then that actually will cause us to passively reabsorb about half of our urea because it's now it's so concentrated that uh, we'll passively be able to reabsorb it. And that's good. It saves us energy because we actually wanted to reabsorb about half of that urea. Now, interestingly, we can easily measure urea in the blood and in the urine, and we can take that comparison to calculate our GFR. Um, we didn't do this in lab, but it can easily be done. And it's, um, so blood urea nitrogen test called the bun test. You would compare that to your urine concentration of, uh, of urea. Okay. So please remember urea and urine are not the same thing. Urea is one of the components of urine. Okay. Now this word, this is creatinine. Creatinine is from creatine. Okay. Creatinine is another substance that uh, we could use we can measure in the blood and we can measure in the uh, urine and we could calculate our GFR from that. Um, creatinine is not able to be reabsorbed. And so we'll see this again um, in a minute. Okay, so a little problem for you to work on. A patient with diabetes presents with glucose in the urine and polyuria, frequent urination. So when we say presents, it means they have symptoms of, okay? So a patient comes with glucose in the urine and frequent urination. In uh, normal, healthy patients, patients that don't have diabetes, you would not have glucose, okay? So using this knowledge, explain why it makes sense that you have frequent urination when you're diabetic. Okay, so pause the video and then we'll discuss after you've worked through it. Okay, recall that water is reabsorbed in everywhere except for the ascending limb. Okay, sodium is reabsorbed in the ascending limb. By the time the filtrate reaches your loop of Henle, you should not have any glucose there. Having the glucose in the filtrate in your loop of Henle interferes with the ability of water to leak. So you have your filtrate is coming down the descending limb of Henle and usually you get lots of water um, freely leaving because of that sodium that leaves the ascending, right? So you have sodium in that um, interstitial space that attracts the water, but if you have glucose, and it shouldn't be there, but if you have glucose in that, in that loop, water's going to be attracted and stay to with the glucose, so you don't get as much water um, reabsorbed water doesn't leave your tubule, your loop of Henle. Um, and so then of course, now you're gonna have more water in your urine because that glucose will still be there. The glucose, if it doesn't get reabsorbed um, before the loop, it's not going to be reabsorbed, okay? You only have that one chance to do it. So, now you're stuck with this um, glucose in your loop of Henle, and it's gonna also go to your um, distal uh, convoluted tubule and your collecting, collecting duct. Remember the ascending limb, water's not able to get through it, but we do usually reabsorb more water in that um, distal um, convoluted tubule and especially in our collecting duct. Um, but if glucose is in the filtrate at that point, you're not going to get as much water reabsorption, okay? All right, good job. So aldosterone 
There's a constant amount of sodium reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule and the loop. Well, the descending uh, part is for water and the ascending part of the loop is for sodium. Okay. Extra reabsorption if aldosterone is released from the adrenal gland, right? So you make the um, permeability of the distal convoluted tubule higher. Like you make it more permeable to sodium. So you're going to get more sodium taken out of the filtrate back into the blood. Okay. So that's the job of aldosterone. You saw this in lab. You know that it's going to increase your sodium intake, right? You're going to reabsorb sodium from the filtrate and water's going to follow, right? Water always follows the sodium. So now you're not going to have as much water in your urine. You're going to have more water. That's right, in the blood. So your blood volume will increase, your urine volume will decrease. Opposite of aldosterone is your atrial natriuretic peptide. So if your blood pressure is high, you're going to have this hormone released to decrease your blood volume so that you can decrease your blood pressure. And specifically, it's going to decrease the permeability of that same region, the distal convoluted tubule, is no longer going to be able to absorb as much sodium. If you don't absorb as much sodium, you don't get as much water, and so now your blood volume will be able to drop so your blood pressure can drop, okay? Um, so this is a diuretic, right? Um, you're not absorbing as much sodium, so you're not absorbing as much water, so that water is gonna go in your urine. All right. Fun fact, human kidneys filter over one million gallons of blood in a lifetime, right? We talked about this in a little bit in the first, um, part of lecture in class together, that the kidneys are amazing. They filter so much water, so much blood. Okay, so now we're going to look at uh, some cells that release hormones to control blood pressure. And they're, these cells are located at this very specific region called the juxtoglomerular apparatus, juxtaglomerular apparatus. Just when you think our words can't get any more difficult, right? All right, so let's look at this next picture. Look closer up. Okay, so right here, this little square, this is what we're seeing. Okay, so we have two types of cells that we're interested in, the macula densa and the granular cells. Okay, the macula densa cells in the nephron and the and the granular cells together are the juxtaglomerular glomerular apparatus. Juxta juxtaglomerular apparatus. Their job is to measure the pressure in both the afferent and efferent arterioles. Right, so the place where the efferent and afferent arterioles come together to make your um, Bowman's capsule, right? Um, you have two types of cells present to detect that pressure. And again, that's how we can regulate our blood pressure, okay? So their job is to measure the pressure in the ferret and efferent arterioles and then release hormones accordingly to change the blood pressure. Okay. So we call that system the renin angiotensin mechanism. Okay. So re recall from lab, angiotensinogen is constantly produced in the liver, always present. Only when needed, renin will be released 
from the granular cells. That's going to catalyze angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 will be converted with the enzyme angiotensin converting enzyme, which is also constantly made strangely in the lungs. Don't ask, I don't know why, but the lungs are the ones making our angiotensin converting enzyme constantly. And so, um, so really the determining factor here is renin, right? Renin enzymes only release from the kidneys when needed, specifically from those granular cells. Okay, then the rest of it's going to bam, bam, happen. You're going to get angiotensin two. This is a systemic vasoconstrictor, meaning everywhere in the body, you're going to get some vasoconstriction happening. That's going to cause your blood pressure to increase, right? Angiotensin II is going to trigger the adrenal gland to release aldosterone. Aldosterone is going to cause more absorption of sodium. Do you remember where? Yes, in the distal convoluted tubule. Okay, good job. Oh, and so this reabsorption of sodium, more water will be reabsorbed, right? It's gonna, water's gonna fall out the sodium. And so that's also gonna cause increase in blood pressure. So we have two mechanisms of an increase in blood pressure from this system. So that tells you that renin is going to only be released when your blood pressure is too low. Right, so the kidneys, the granular cells detect that your blood pressure is low, they release renin, and then you, bam, bam, you increase your blood pressure. Okay, secretion. Remember, secretion is the kind of the weird thing where you didn't get into the filtrate in Bowman's capsule but further down the line, you just directly dump something into the filtrate from the blood. And this happens, uh, we see this happen with our protons to maintain our pH. We also see it happen with potassium. Okay, so movement from um, patubular capillaries, right? The capillaries that are surrounding your nephron can just dump things straight into the filtrate. They don't get filtered in the glomerulus. Okay. Um, potassium secretion is primarily regulated in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. Um, if the blood potassium is high, then you're going to increase your secretion. Makes sense. Okay, this is, um, it's like the picture we saw earlier tilted on its side. So now this is the lumen here, this is the inside of the cell, and then your blood capillary is not shown, but it would be all the way to the right. Okay, so this is showing your potassium secretion is coupled to sodium reabsorption, and you already knew that because you know that this is your sodium potassium pump. So remember, this first part here is not a pump, it's um, passive diffusion is facilitated, so you have a channel, but it's not a pump. Only the one with the X is the pump and takes ATP, okay? And bo but both of these places, you have opposite direction. Well, here you have the opposite direction, right? Sodium goes one way, potassium goes the other. But here we have both sodium and potassium um, going in the same direction, okay? So, NAK that requires ATP is in the basolateral membrane. So right here, basolateral membrane. This is going from the uh, loop inside of the loop cell to the blood capillary over here. So filtrate cell, interstitial fluid space, interstitial space, and then your capillary would be here. 
Okay, so NAK requires ATP. So in a sodium potassium pump or ATPase is in the basolateral membrane, reabsorbs sodium into the blood, gets rid of potassium out of the blood, right? They go in opposite directions, sodium potassium pump. Okay, how much of this happens is controlled by aldosterone. A high potassium level in the blood directly stimulates adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. So you don't need that whole renin system. Um, potassium will directly stimulate the release of aldosterone. And of course the opposite is true. If it was too low, it would uh, suppress aldosterone. Okay. Secretion of drugs. It's really, really important that we get our dosages on our prescriptions correct. So nurses, doctors, and pharmacists all need to confirm the size weight of the individual and exactly what the correct dosage is. Um, people die when we overdose, right? Overdose. Um, and I, I believe uh, when about, what, 10 years ago, uh, there was in one year from San Jose Hospital, three patients died from an error. Um, they got too much medication and, and they died. Okay, so this is really important. Okay, the body, any of these drugs, whether you need it, um, right, if you're taking medication, it's because you need it to correct something, but the body doesn't know that. The body just knows it's foreign and it needs to get rid of it. Okay, so all foreign substances need to be secreted. This is one reason why we need to calculate and correct dosages for patients, okay? So yes, ultimately it is the pharmacist's job, but it should really start with uh, the nurse getting all the adequate, very accurate um, measurements of the patient so that the doctor can calculate it correctly. And then the pharmacist should be double checking that the doctor did their part right. Okay, so everybody needs to make sure that that patient gets the correct dosage. Okay, so here's a little, another um, activity for you. Imagine you're going to the movies and you're eating a big bag of popcorn and you're drinking a big drink, um, soda, which you know you're not supposed to drink, but you did. Okay, so how is this going to this high salt in the popcorn, this high glucose, and of course soda is made mostly of water even though it's packed full of sugar and all sorts of junk, um, it is still water. So you get a lot of sodium, you get a lot of water, you get a lot of sugar. How do those three things affect the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted, convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct, okay? Any hormones that are going to be released because of these, be specific. And what are they gonna do? Okay, pause it. This should take you about five minutes. Okay, trust that you actually attempted this and now you're ready for your discussion. So the answers are actually on the next slide. Um, so recall that no matter how much sugar you eat, unless you're diabetic, 